once again. I hope I find you well at this time. Now, we're going to be joined by Pastor Mazibuko with the topic, The Someone of Kindness. Let these words of wisdom sink into your minds, and I hope you learn something from them and apply it in your lives. It is said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is said in the book of Psalms by David, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Now may you find this wisdom that endures forever, and may it be a blessing to you in Jesus' mighty name. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, O God, for your wisdom. Thank you, O God, that you are willing to impart your wisdom to us. Help us, O God, we may be truly appreciated. that we know, God, that you love us and you pray for us. Help us, O God, to share this love with others in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Danzwane Zikomborero Kuwa patenzi Mamwe wa Riku goshira Madonwe Mutipenji Marikone neni Marikone neni Madonwe Mutipenji Oh, 
to verse 15 of John chapter 5 and this uh, is what the Bible says. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the ship gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. They were waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. But the one who was healed did not know who it is that had healed him, for Jesus had withdrawn from the multitude uh, that was in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy of reading your word, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to be our great teacher in helping us to understand the word. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. In John chapter 5, Jesus is in Jerusalem for one of the feasts of the Jews. The Bible tells us that on this Sabbath, as was indeed his occasion, after having preached in the synagogue, Jesus then goes out and he walks to this pool, the pool that is known as Bethesda. On this pool lay many people who were sick with different diseases. It was a belief among the Jews that there was an angel that would descend once a day and this angel would stir up the water so that on this particular day, as the water is stirred up, the one who would enter the water first would then be healed. And so when Jesus arrived at this pool, there were many who lay here, thousands, under the five porches that surrounded the pool, waiting for the water to be stirred up so that they might be healed. Now the Bible says, as Jesus looked at all of them, his eyes landed on this man who had been sick for 38 years. This is the man that Jesus approached and asked, do you want to be made well? And the man replied, he said, there is no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to move, someone else enters first and they receive the healing. Then Jesus says to him, get up, take up your mat and go. This Jesus did on a Sabbath. And as the Bible shows us, when the man was now seen in the temple by the leaders, they asked him, why are you carrying your mat on a Sabbath? And he told them, that the one who had healed me had told me to do this. Not knowing who Jesus was, the leaders asked him who it is, but the man could not answer. Later on, this man would be met by Jesus in the temple, and Jesus would say to the man, now that you are healed, try to live a righteous life so that worse things do not happen to you. 
It was there that the man then got to know that his healer was Jesus, and he then informed the leaders that it is Jesus who had healed him. I want us to revisit now the story and look at the lessons that God would like us to learn from the story. On a Sabbath, Jesus leaves the synagogue to go uh, out and find uh, those whom he could help. It was the custom of Jesus that every Sabbath he would split his Sabbath into two. He would always be at the synagogue on the earlier parts of the Sabbath, preaching, and then in the afternoons, Jesus would be found going out, looking for those whom he might help. And this, of course, is a powerful lesson for Sabbath keepers because Jesus did this deliberately and intentionally. Jesus deliberately and intentionally on a Sabbath went out to find people that he might help. As a lesson to all Sabbath keepers that the Sabbath is a day of liberty for everyone. And that to be in church the whole day on Sabbath was not consistent with the message of the kingdom of God. In fact, we know that Jesus did this so seriously that he ended up dying for it. When we read our Bibles, we know two things about the death of Jesus. Why did Jesus die? He died for you and me, that we may be atoned for our sins. But legally, why was Jesus crucified? In other words, what was the charge on the charge sheet? Well, we know what was the charge. Jesus faced two charges, breaking the Sabbath and claiming equality with God, which is blasphemy. That was the legal charge. The two charges came with a capital punishment under Jewish law. Jesus had broken the Sabbath so many times the Jews wanted to kill him. But is that not interesting? That the Jews wanted to kill the man who gave them the Sabbath because they accused him of breaking the Sabbath. The question they should have asked is, teach us how to keep the Sabbath because you are the one who gave us the Sabbath in Eden. The way Jesus kept the Sabbath is the way that all Sabbath keepers should be keeping it today. Now, when you read your Bible, from Mark chapter 2, John chapter 5, and many other verses, what do we see? At the center of the conflict between Jesus and the leaders of the Jews was the Sabbath. Jesus was very clear, doing it repeatedly. He wanted to show the leaders of Israel that it is not biblical, that it is not the way of God to be in the synagogue the whole Sabbath. This is a message that many Seventh-day Adventists must learn. To sit in church the whole Sabbath is the Pharisaic way of keeping the Sabbath. The way of God, the way of Jesus says, when you keep the Sabbath, one, Yes, go to church and be blessed, just as Jesus would go to synagogues and be blessed. Two, go out and look for those who are in need of the love of God. Show them the love of God on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day to feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to visit those who are in hospitals and in prisons. How do we know it? Well, our Savior, the giver of the Sabbath, did it that way. We have no other option but to do it the way the giver taught us to do it. And so Jesus did exactly that. On a Sabbath, he came out looking for those who needed his help. He came to the pool of Bethesda. And we will come back to this name Bethesda because it has significance for what we are learning in this story. When Jesus arrived there, Thousands of people were there, waiting for the miracle of the moving of the waters. The Jews believed that once a day an angel would descend from heaven and would stir up the water, and the one who would get in first would be healed. Firstly, 
If you listen very carefully, there's a problem about this miracle, Jesus and the Sabbath and the Jews. Because the Jews believe there's an angel that descends once a day, including the Sabbath. Including the Sabbath. And this angel will stir up the water so that whoever enters the water first would be healed. Now, why would they have a problem if Jesus heals on Sabbath? When they don't have a problem with an angel that descends and stirs up the water on Sabbath so that they may be healed. Unless, of course, there was no angel that descended on Sabbath to heal the waters. More than that, something about this angel does not make sense when we weigh it against the character of God. Listen to the miracle very carefully. An angel descends from heaven stares up the water. The one who enters first is healed. That's a problem. Why? Because for starters, those then who had small illnesses stand a higher chance of being healed. And those with very big sicknesses or illnesses, they may not get healed. What do I mean? If you are struggling with cancer, and you are at the pool of Bethesda, you can't get healed. Because if I have flu, I am stronger than you. So when the angel touches the water, those who had flu were already standing at the edge of the pool. And as soon as the water is touched, they just step in and they are healed. Those on the other hand who were bedridden, who could not move, they could not enter that water. The whole concept of healing here was against the mercy of God. It was a cruel way. Those who were less sick got healed. Those who were more sick never got healed because they could not move into the pool. This type of healing does not really add up to the character of God we read about in the Bible. Something about it doesn't make sense. So this angel firstly doesn't add up on a Sabbath and doesn't add up on the character of God. This appears to have been a belief, albeit people believed it, but I do not find in the scripture itself evidence to suggest that this miracle was true. So Jesus arrives there, and when Jesus looks at them, the Bible says he then saw this man. What is happening? It appears that through the divine mind, as Jesus was scanning all of them and their needs, his eyes landed on this man. This man who had been sick for 38 years. Before I go further, I think it's important to note in this story that Jesus here illust illustrates a knowledge about us. A knowledge that heaven has about us that anyone else may not have about us. When Jesus looked at all of them, he knew them. He knew where they were coming from. He knew what they were sick with. He knew how much the sickness had eaten up their lives, their emotions, the depression they were going through. He knew them. He knew them in detail. So when Jesus went to this man, it is not because he didn't care about the others, but there was something that said to him, the time was ripe for this man to receive his deliverance. And so Jesus went to him and Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? The man doesn't understand the question. The simple answer should have been yes or no. Yes, I want to get well. Or no, I don't want to get well. Instead, the man says to Jesus, you know, sir, Every time the water is stirred up, as I try to make my way, someone else gets in there first. So in other words, when this miracle of the water is perceived to be happening, there would be a rush for people to enter, and this man would be unable to enter. He had been sick for a very long time. The Bible doesn't say he had been at the pool for 38 years. It says he had been sick for 38 years. How many years he had spent at the pool, we do not know. 
what we do see is that he had been here long enough that any friends or family that he may have had were no longer here to help him. He was on his own when it came to moving himself into the water. And of course, those who were less sick were always beating him to the race. They were always entering the water first. And such may be the condition of your life as we speak this word today. You may feel as though whenever it comes to answered prayer, whenever it comes to people getting what they want in life, it seems you never get your way. People are always overtaking you. People are always getting jobs. People are always getting healing. People are always getting happy homes and you are just waiting there. Nothing seems to be happening about your case. Well, the good news today is that Jesus sees every case and that Jesus answers every case. In this story, the pool is called Bethesda and this is why it is significant because the name Bethesda means a house of kindness or a city of mercy. This man, what attracted Jesus to this man is revealed in the answer. Listen to the man very carefully. When Jesus asks, do you want to, get to be made well? The man says, I have no one to take me in. What is the man saying? The man is saying to Jesus, you know what? Healing no longer matters to me anymore. I have been sick for so long. I have accepted that I won't get healed. All I want now is for someone to show me kindness. Whether they put me in the water or they take me back home to die. That's all I want. I just want somebody to show me kindness. And this is the interesting part. The man was lying at the pool of Bethesda. A pool called a city of kindness. Yet no one was being kind to him. And this is what Jesus saw in the man. That the man needed more than just healing. That this man was now in search of kindness. He was in search of mercy. He was in search of somebody who could just look upon him with an, uh, with an eye for kindness. And Jesus had come that day. So Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? But the man had been so broken by his suffering. He no longer even understood the question. He just wanted somebody to pity him. And I think many of us in our different infirmities understand what this man is going through. Or rather was going through. Some of us are physically sick like this man. Others are spiritually sick, emotionally sick, financially sick, relationship sick. Such that when we listen to this man, we understand him. We are tired. We are just tired. And we are looking for somebody to pity us. Somebody to carry us, whether we are being carried home to die or we are being carried to be healed but we just want somebody to show us kindness. Jesus responded. He responded perhaps because many of the people who were there were still looking for the miracle of healing, but this man was looking for the miracle of a carrier. He was looking for the miracle of kindness. He was looking for the miracle of a redeemer. He was looking for the miracle of a savior. He was no longer looking for healing. He was looking for somebody. You've got to listen to his answer very carefully. He doesn't say, I want to be healed. He says, there's nobody to carry me. Now his greatest prayer is for somebody. He just wants somebody to pity him. Somebody to carry him. Somebody to love him. Somebody to be kind to him. His answer now is a somebody, not a something. He's no longer looking for a something. He wants a somebody. And that is the cry of salvation. That we don't want a something. We want a somebody. And that is why Jesus came at the cross to die for us. Because we needed a somebody. We didn't need a something. We needed a someone who would save us from our sin and what we were going through. And that is why then Jesus comes to the man. 
and says, do you want to get him? Jesus offers him a something and the man cries for a somebody. And that is what Jesus was looking for. Somebody who needs a savior more than they need a something. And Jesus says to the man, do you want to get him? And the man says, I want someone. Someone who can look at me with pity. Someone who can look at me and love me. Someone who can look at me and carry me. This is the call of salvation. That the world needs someone. The world needs someone. But here's the challenge. The man already had someone. The someone was standing with him. The someone was saying to him, Now that I am here, everything you want will come true. Because the great someone is here, everything you want could come true. And so the great someone asks him, Do you want something? Do you want to be healed? You can get your healing because the great someone is now here. I am here for you. What do you want? The man still did not recognize at this time that he finally had someone. He finally, at the lake of kindness, had found a kind man. And the kind man was Jesus. And so Jesus says to him, do you want to be healed? I am here. I am paying attention to you. No one before has ever asked you if you want to be healed. In other words, I am saying to you, sick man, your prayers have been answered. The someone you've been praying for has arrived. The somebody to pity you has arrived. The someone to show you kindness has arrived. I am now here. No one has been asking you what you want. The, re the fact that I am asking you is a sign that your prayer has been answered. Now tell me, do you want to be healed? When Jesus is around, it is not time to be saying, I need somebody. It is time to be saying, I need something. Because the prayer of the somebody has been answered. Jesus himself has arrived. And the man says, I can't even get in. Because when I need to get in, people rush ahead of me. Because I am sick more than others. I am an invalid I am somebody that is worse off. I can't get in there. Jesus doesn't entertain this man. Jesus simply says to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Jesus instructs him. Jesus doesn't say to him, take my hand and come up. Why? Because the man was broken. The man was an invalid. The Bible calls him an invalid, someone who doesn't exist, someone who is dead, someone who is gone. And that is why Jesus doesn't even pick him up. Jesus instructs him why. Because the great I am was now here and the man needed to be created anew. See, Jesus spoke to this man the same way he spoke the universe into existence from nothing. In the beginning, God simply spoke. He simply said, let there be, and it was. This is why when Jesus spoke to this man, he says to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Three instructions. Get up, pick up your mat, walk. And the man doesn't say, oh, let me try. The man found himself standing. The man found himself picking up the mat. And the man found himself walking. This is why he didn't know the name of Jesus. Because he wasn't able to stand and talk to Jesus. Because power had been instructed in him. He simply stood up, pick, picked up the mat and walked. He never had a chance to say thank you. He never had a chance to ask what is your name. Because the power that spoke at creation had now spoken in him. You see, Jesus realized this man was too broken to understand what Jesus was saying. A miracle was needed to act on him. Then later on, I want you to notice something very powerful here. Later on, now that the man is used to walking, 
Now that the man has an experience of walking, Jesus then comes to him and says, now let me teach you something. Avoid a sinful life. Live a righteous life. Only then will you avoid such things happening to you again. Do you notice what is happening here? Do you notice what Jesus is teaching us Christians? The first time Jesus met the man, what did Jesus do? He healed him and dismissed him. In other words, the first time Jesus met him, he gave him what he needed the most and then let him go. The second time Jesus met the man, he now fed him doctrine. He fed him a spiritual message. How many Christians don't understand this? You cannot preach doctrine until you have addressed the needs of people. Jesus only spoke about sin and righteousness after he had met the man and healed him. First, he healed him, created him anew, gave him time to get used to walking. Afterwards, spoke to him about sin and righteousness. How many of us have held crusades about Daniel and Revelation in a poor community that is hungry, showing that we do not understand the method of Jesus Christ? Ellen White says, this method of Jesus alone will be the only one that will change the world. What method is that? Ellen White continues to explain. She says, he fed the hungry, raised the dead, and only then did he bid them come follow me. He addressed their needs before he taught them doctrine. The church has to understand, if we don't make the world a better place, we are simply teaching a theology that has no Christ in it. We've got to change the lives of people before we teach them anything. Transformation must come before inspiration. We must always transform before we inspire. Because when we have transformed, people are willing to listen. How do we know? It's in the story itself. In, on Sabbath, you are not supposed to be carrying anything. When the leaders saw him, what do they say? Why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? What does he say? The one who healed me told me. Listen to the power of this. He doesn't know any doctrine yet about the man who healed him. But he has an experience with him. This guy doesn't yet know the name of Jesus. He doesn't even know whether Jesus is a 50% God or 50% man or just a man. He knows nothing about the nature of Christ and the nature of man. He knows nothing about the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of salvation. He knows nothing about Trinity. He knows nothing. All he knows is the man who healed me told me to carry the mat. For that reason, the man who healed me has the authority to tell me how to keep the Sabbath. Why? Because he healed me. That is very important. You see, a testimony will always be more powerful than a doctrine. What many of us don't understand, we want to push to teach people doctrines. Why are people filling up in all these churches where there are miracles? It is because a testimony will always be more powerful than a doctrine. That we have to remember. You have got to first introduce people to an experience with Jesus before you introduce them to a doctrine about Jesus. This man didn't know the name of Jesus, but he could already say, the man who healed me is my teacher on how to keep the Sabbath. Because he healed me on the Sabbath, because he told me to carry my mat on the Sabbath, I will do what he told me. When Jesus met him the second time, then Jesus told him, oh, by the way, live a righteous life. Do not sin. My name is Jesus. Then the man went back to them and said, hey, now I know the doctrine about the man who healed me. Not only is he my healer, 
He has also taught me about sin and righteousness. And his name is Jesus. I know his name. I know his teachings. And I have an experience with his power in my life. I want to tell you that also you and I can have an experience with Jesus. You see, many of us are stuck like this man. In different situations, each and every one of us are dealing with our 38 years sentence in sickness, in poverty, in uh, depression, in unhappiness. But this message I want to share with you today, there is a way to be relieved. And that way is very simple. Invite the great someone to come into your life. That great someone is Jesus. I want to tell you there is nothing we can go through that Jesus cannot address. And I want to tell you it doesn't matter how many years. You see the lakes of this world will pass you by. The lakes of this world will only favor others but only Jesus recognizes everyone. Only Jesus is enough for all of us. And when Jesus is standing with you, his question is, do you want to be healed? And I know that many of us may not understand what is Jesus asking. Because we have suffered for so long, we have been ignored for so long, we do not realize there is a Savior called Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I want to challenge you this afternoon. Would you allow Jesus to heal you? Would you allow Jesus to bring to an end your infirmities, our invalidities, our challenges? There is a Savior who can see you and I for what we are. More than what friends and family and husbands and wives and parents and children can see. There's a Savior who looks at us and understands our entire life story. But also I want to pose this as a call to all of us. That when we spread the good news... Let us follow the way of Jesus. Let us give people an experience with Jesus before we give them doctrine. Because doctrine will never be more powerful than a testimony. But when a proper doctrine is placed on an irrefutable testimony, then that life is saved and shall never be taken away. May you have your own experience with Jesus. May you have your own testimony with Jesus Christ. Because without that testimony, it will not be easy to find your way in this life. That testimony is very important. And I want to pray now that may you also find your healing in Jesus Christ. Whatever your challenge, whatever you are going through, whatever the pain that you are dealing with, I don't have to understand it. The great someone is here. I know that there are many of us who identify with the story because we are desperately in need of kindness. We are surrounded by a cruel world. So many of us, we have friends on Facebook in their thousands, yet we commit suicide. Because the reality is that as connected as we are, we live in a very lonely, very painful world. We are in search of a Bethesda, a house of kindness. Jesus is our Bethesda. Jesus is our house and lake of kindness. And anyone who is in Jesus, we are not alone. We are not alone when we are in Jesus. There is always a way to be healed. Because Jesus knows everyone. Knows everyone's story. And knows what we need from him. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. With the fact that in you we have a friend. In you we have a savior. In you we have our Bethesda. And I pray for each and every person listening to this message that they will find their Bethesda in you, Jesus. That they will find whatever healing of any type that they, your people need. Some are poor. Some are in need of work. Some are in need of healing physically. Some are going through mental illness challenges. Some are going through family infirmities. But all of it can be healed when we come to the lake that is Jesus Christ. And we thank you because... You come to us. We don't have to go to you. We thank you because like this man, many of us, you will come and stand wherever we are and we will find healing in you. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. 
tenzi andi nangi sen fuma te pasi pam di no che ma ku pina mudanga ku soro mutambare umamom wenyu we ku Sin kutinda kanyora dino da kusiwa kutinda kanyora mutamba. Zita zo zangu shawanda se chetam asiro parore yum rinondi pone sa shichi zito zo chenyum chanyo ramu samba. Shitema zaka chuka Dino zice nura Dino da kusiwa Kutina kanyora Mutambare upenyu Erenda kanyora Shawa kana kisa simba te kupenya ne manu mane bi ne guza zachena hakuna zaka imba izuzi no pinda. Niro si tino ringa Yerenda kanyora Tino da kusiwa Kutina kanyora Mutamba na upenyu Yerenda kanyora Kutinda kanyora Mutambare upenyu Erenda kanyora Dino da kusiwa Kutinda kanyora Mutambare Oh. 
Ce 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 